kitchen reigned confusion and despair. One addition of the jelly was trickled from pot to pot, another lay upon the floor, and a third was burning gaily on the stove. Lottie, with Teutonic phlegm, was calmly eating bread and currant wine, for the jelly was still in a hopelessly liquid state, while Mrs. Brooke, with her apron over her head, sat sobbing dismally. "'My dearest girl, what is the matter?' cried John, rushing in with awful visions of scalded hands, sudden news of affliction and secret constatation at the thought of the guest in the garden. Oh, John, I am so tired and hot and cross and worried. I've been at it till I'm worn out. Do come and help me or I shall die. And the exhausted housewife cast herself upon his breast, giving him a sweet welcome in every sense of the world, for her pinafore had been baptised at the same time as the floor. "'What worries you, dear? Has anything dreadful happened?' asked the anxious John, tenderly kissing the crown of the little cap which was all askew. "'Yes,' sobbed Meg despairingly. "'Tell me quick, then. Don't cry. I can bear anything better than that. Out with it, love.' "'The jelly won't chill, and I don't know what to do.' John Brooke laughed then, as he never dared to laugh afterward and the derisive Scot smiled involuntarily as he heard the hearty peal which put the finishing stroke to poor Meg's woo. Is that all? Fling it out of the window, and don't bother any more about it. I'll buy you quartz if we want it, but for heaven's sake don't have hysterics, for I've brought Jack Scott home to dinner, and... John got no further, for Meg cast him off and clasped her hands with a tragic gesture as she fell into a chair exclaiming in a tone of mingled indignation, reproach and dismay. A man to dinner and everything in a mess? John Brooke, how could you do such a thing? Hush, he's in the garden. I forgot the confounded jelly, but it can't be helped now, said John surveying the prospect with an anxious eye. You ought to have sent word or told me this in the morning. You ought to have remembered how busy I was continued Meg petulantly, for even turtle doves will peck when ruffled. I didn't know it this morning, and there was no time to send word, for I met him on the way out. I never thought of asking leave when you have always told me to do as I like. I never tried it before, and hang me if I ever do again, added John with an aggrieved air. I should hope not. Take him away at once. I can't see him, and there isn't any dinner. Well, I like that. Where's the beef and vegetables I sent home and the pudding you promised? cried John, rushing to the larder. I hadn't time to cook anything. I meant to dine at Mother's. I'm sorry, but I was so busy. And Meg's tears began again. John was a mild man, but he was human. And after a long day's work, to come home tired, hungry and hopeful, to find a chaotic house, an empty table and a cross wife was not exactly conducive to repose of mind or manner. He restrained himself. However, the little squaw would have blown over, but for one unlucky word. It's a scrape, I acknowledge, but if you will lend a hand, we'll pull through and we'll have a good time yet. Don't cry, dear. Just exert yourself a bit and knock us up something to eat. We're both as hungry as hunters, so we shan't mind what it is. Give us cold meat and bread and cheese. We won't ask for jelly. He meant it for a good-natured joke, but that one word sealed his fate. Meg thought it was too cruel to hint about her sad failure, and the last atom of patience vanished as he spoke. You must get yourself out of that scrape as you can. I'm too used to exert myself for anyone. It's like a man to propose a bone and vulgar bread and cheese for company. I won't have anything of this sort in my house. Take that Scott up to Mother's and tell him I'm away. Sick. Dead. Anything. I won't see him and you two can laugh at me and my jelly as much as you like. You won't have anything else here. And having delivered her defiance all in one breath, Meg cast away her pinafore and precipitately left the field to beam in herself in her own room.